Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, Sacred Geography, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum. Update Monday, April 3rd, around 9 p.m. Mountain Time, 2023. Several large quakes struck the Earth in the last 24 hours. But the big story, extraordinary moment, Sierra snowpack among the largest on record. Keep calm. It's boom time. Take a look at here. California state water officials took measurements in the snow near Lake Tahoe on Monday and announced this year's Sierra Nevada snowpack is among the largest ever recorded. This news brings relief that the three-year drought will be easing, but also raises huge concerns that the monster snowpack could bring dangerous flooding as it melts through spring and summer. Ding, ding. California snowpack is one of the largest ever. Now, this is going to fill Lake Tulare to a level that hasn't been seen since maybe early 1900s or earlier. There is 7 million acre feet of water that needs to come down into the South San Joaquin Valley, and it's going to get spicy as record setting snow for the Northern Michigan is present and more on the way for the UP. Homes are collapsing under record snowfall in Park City, Utah. It's insanity as the global warming narrative continues to be pressed by the mainstream media. Shut up, Al! Get in your hole! Utah's statewide snowpack average is now 201% of normal. That's incredible if you consider where we've been over the past year. That's good at helping Utah's overall drought situation with refilling reservoirs and the south arm of the Great Salt Lake has already risen about three feet. That does make me feel really good. No one anticipated. I mean, we were hoping for a good year, but I don't think anyone anticipated this sort of year. And to have the whole state, you know, so many years we have one area that does well and one area that doesn't. And to have the whole state doing well, it's great. Now, the state's drought coordinator says it's done a lot to help dig us out of the drought, but water conservation is still going to be important as we head into the summer to ensure that water resources are there. Reservoirs still need to recharge because... Good news in Utah and good news in North Dakota. A blizzard is about to blast them. And Bismarck could set its seasonal all-time snowfall record. This sounds like a broken record. And you can hear... Al is being quiet in the background. Now, cleanup from Friday's storm continues as more severe weather is expected this week, so heed the warnings. Tornado threats return to Iowa, Iowa on Tuesday evening, so there is a severe risk from Waterloo South to Quincy, so heads up, and that is tomorrow. As severe storms and tornadoes are possible from Texas to Illinois. Stay tuned for the full forecast in just a second here. Wind is causing outages and block roads in Monterey County, and that's not the only place. There was a 77-mile-per-hour wind gust warning for parts of Arizona, East Central. We've had winds blasting all day, and it is, well, winds that are continuous and blasting you are exhausting, and I'm exhausted. Here's the forecast. Significant weather in the southwest, central, and northern U.S. An intensifying storm will bring high winds and extremely critical fire weather to the southwest. Blizzard conditions and wind chills below zero in the northern plains and another significant severe weather outbreak in areas that experienced recent severe weather impacts. It's absolutely a devastating spring and it's just beginning severe storms across much of the mississippi valley may produce strong tornadoes damaging winds and very large hail take a look at the red flag warnings in half a dozen states it's blowing like a crazy man out here in archuleta and we only get the brown the brown warning what is that high wind there it is so even the brown is high wind and the pink it's like a quarter of the u.s blowing and a huge area Dozens of counties in North and South Dakota with blizzard warnings up, as well as North Western Nebraska. So take a looky here. Click on your county for more info. This is going to be a big one. Here we can see the system develop at 986 low right there in Colorado. That's what's causing the wind outside my door. It's going to quickly bomb out with heavy snow in the next 12 hours. Boom, boom, boom. Eastern Wyoming, as we predicted yesterday, is going to get the biggest totals, maybe four feet, but the gusting. 
and the drifting will be insane. Near zero visibility in North Dakota tomorrow for much of the state as this system bombs out, makes its way up into Canada with a huge amount of sleet and freezing rain up in the northern tier there. So beware. That's going to move into Quebec and Ontario and completely obliterate the morning commute on Thursday. Take a look at that. So heavy moisture and severe weather will pop up in the southeast during the storm. And we just clicked the wrong button. But you can see a complete line here of severe weather here Thursday, April 6th. So heed the warnings. When you hear that tornado siren, get underground. Let's take a look at the snowfall totals. That's all the way out to April 19th. Here is your Tuesday, which will be your lose day in eastern Wyoming, especially if you're in that bullseye. Holy macaroni. So Wednesday, that storm will move all the way up into Canada through Wednesday. That is the snow totals. Take a look at that. It's going to be a swath of 16 inches through South Dakota. Say it ain't soda, but it is soda. And also be a, quite a nice slathering up there in Maine. It's insane. And that, this is just through Thursday. So here we are at Friday. More heavy snow is going to move into the Pacific Northwest and move into Idaho by Sunday. So that is your weekend surprise, Idaho, 16 inches in the high alleys. Now, Papua New Guinea had a massive earthquake just about 26 hours ago, 7.0 magnitude, and they're just able to assess the damage. It's in such a remote region. But some buildings and homes were destroyed near the quake's epicenter in the northern part of the Pacific Nation, according to Matthew Mohoy, the acting assistant director of the Port Moresby Geophysical Observatory. He said disaster relief workers were trying to verify whether there were any deaths or serious injuries. So clearly a remote region. And let's take a look at the quakes. Uh, there is that Papua New Guinea quake. There was no the tsunami... No tsunami warnings. It was on land, in fact. So let's just move this back to one day all magnitude here. And let's look at two other large quakes. We had a 6.1 here on, in the far western Indonesia and a major rocker, 6.5, near the east coast of the Kamchatka Peninsula. Now this is, well, is this volcanic related? All you have to do is come over here on your map and check out the satellite. You can easily see the location of the volcanoes on the Kamchatka, and there, there is one there right there. Is that Kluchiskyov, perhaps? Shivalush? No, that's not Shivalush. But definitely, you can see volcanoes all over on the Kamchatka, so this could be magma preparing for the next big boom. Here we also have a lot of... Uh, Pretty significant quake, 5.0 in El Salvador. And if you remember an update we did about three years ago, new scientific evidence coming out that there's going to be some major earthquake activity right here near from Costa Rica south, ongoing probably for decades. It's long overdue, and there's some kind of slow slip, lateral, transverse, multidimensional pressures in this region of the plates. So... If we see more increased moderate to severe earthquake activity here, it's because the papers and the scientists were correct, which is a rarity these days. Worldwide Volcano News Update. Fuego, Laguna de Mole. Maul? Well, however you say it. Nevados de Ruiz. We warned about that yesterday. Abico. Many others puffing and passing. Abico to 15,000 feet. Laguna de Maul. Volcano. No eruption, but showed up on the chart. I have no idea. Maybe it's foreshadowing. Fuego, minor uh, emissions. And Popo puffing to 25,000 today. We've got Shivalush to 13, Cotopaxi to 21, Sangay to 20,000, Swanos Hima uh, clocking in here at 14,000 with the puff in the pass. 21,000 for Novado de Ruiz, which is not the big boom, by the way, but earthquake swarm still happening. And Shivalush may be gearing up for the Puff Puff Pass. Take a look at space weather news over at solarham.net. The sun is quiet at Solar Max. Just two tiny, tiny spots here. We can see, really, active region 3270, only thing significant. The rest are pinpricks. And this is after a paper just came out, a critical comment on can solar cycle 25 be a new Dalton minimum? Well, no. The Dalton minimum was three solar cycles. So this paper is stupid, just right off the rip. But what is good about this paper is it's new, and it did some machine learning, and it showed that 
Well, yeah, we are in the beginning of a larger grand solar minimum that could be about seven cycles or more, and it is getting weak. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Take a look at this. This is the machine learning. So they are saying that the peak of the cycle is going to be shortly after 2024, summer 2024, perhaps, in, in both of these graphs. But the minimum falling off into this deep grand solar minimum through 2030 without a rise up in the next solar cycle of any significance whatsoever. So this could be the first two cycles. Cycle 26 could be very low, 27 may be non-existent based on this data set. So we are entering a new grand solar minimum of a much larger extent than the Dalton minimum based on this data. Uh, based on their predictions, solar cycle 25 won't be any stronger than 24 here, showing an average of just about 75 sunspots, maybe 90 here or 100. So interesting paper coming out on grand minimas and how little they know about what they're talking about. <laughs> 2023 ZFZ3, massive 150-foot asteroid is approaching Earth on April 6th. Holy macaroni! According to NASA, never a straight answer there. But the 150-foot wide rock, which is hurtling towards Earth at speeds of 67,656. Is that Masonic? Kilometers per hour will make its closest approach to Earth at a distance of 4.19 million kilometers. That sounds like a moon boom. Isn't that how far the moon is away? Gee, holy macaroni. An asteroid ap approaching Earth always makes headlines because a collision with one could result in a massive disaster that Leah and I talk about on our radio show every Saturday on Revolution.radio, Studio B, Noon Mountain Time. That is a gratuitous plug, by the way. Now, according to Jet Propulsion Laboratories, they noted that the Earth will have some relatively close encounters with large rocks which we call asteroids, sometimes comets. In the coming days, five asteroids will approach our planet, with two of them making their closest approaches to Earth today. Hey, hey, hey. But as always, these articles are designed as clickbait, so you can click on them, find out that there's no threat, and go along your way. But you don't want to go along your way with this story, Researchers near Japan capture footage of the deepest fish ever, and it eclipses the last deepest fish by a thousand feet. It's insane. Now, the species or subspecies of fish, it's a snailfish. Snailfish are not deep sea fish, but this here we have a snailfish in the deepest depths where any fish has ever been recorded. It's like three or more miles deep. It's insane. Take a look. Yeah, now this was filmed at a depth of 8,600 meters. That's like four miles. Snailfish are amazing because they are not a deep sea fish. So they're the deepest fish in the world, but they're not a deep sea fish. But they've speciated into every corner of the globe and they've overtaken all the deep sea fish. So these ones, as you see in the video, are 1,000 meters deeper than what you would normally think of as being a deep sea fish. Cute little buggers. Now, as always, all the links will be below the video in the description box. We've been spent, that is the longest, that, that takes the most time linking all of the videos together for you so that you can do your own homework. So please click on the links so that I don't think I, like I'm wasting my time. Now, a couple of really cool stories to finish up on. Cosquare Cave, or Cosquare Cave, is filled with paintings, but the only entrance is deep underwater. You can see where here a small piece of the openings of the caves are, but the cave entrances are deep below the sea. Cosquare Cave is a beautiful display of ancient cave art, remaining one of the only known caves to depict 150 animals across its walls in ornate paintings and engravings of exquisite character and style. The fascinating thing is, 
that these are paintings occurred before advanced civilizations, 10,000 years potentially before. And something is amiss in the archaeological community. These paintings are dated to be 27,000 years old to 19,000, depending on if they're carvings or illustrations like we're looking at here, which are mind-blowing because we were merely cavemen, hunter-gatherers, stupid natives that beat each other in the head with sticks or clubs, like Bam Bam on the Flintstones. Now, during the same time, saber-toothed cats were eating people, so it's no wonder they were in caves. But a newly discovered skull in Iowa, of all places, of a small, the smallest species of saber-toothed tiger is frickin' amazing. Pardon my French. I used to curse like a trucker on this channel. Let me know if you're happy with the change in my dialect. Here we can see the recent saber-toothed find. It's a complete cranium with a single tooth, unfortunately. It says here, albeit missing one of the namesake sabers. These babies, five to six inches in this small cat, will literally bite your head off. So that's a really cool find coming from some of the Pleistocene loesses in Iowa. Can you hear that wind? Wow. Now, scientists discovered a fossilized footprint that looks like a T-Rex, but it's from millions, uh, maybe 32 million years before dinosaurs even existed. This was a massive amphibian with a dinosaur paw. Wow. Researchers have now uncovered proof of an ancient giant amphibian that predates the time of the dinosaurs. Existing over 250 million years ago, the new fossils were discovered at Dave Green Paleo Surface in the KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa. They were discovered in a rock surface and provide a ton of insight into an ancient creature that acted very similar to the crocodile. How do you like them apples? Well, speaking of apples, well, actually, let's speak about barley. <laughs> Vikings were growing barley in Greenland a thousand frickin' years ago, man. So those stories about global warming and how we're all going to burn up, Buy some real estate in Greenland so you can grow barley, apparently. 3,400-year-old year Minoan tomb has been uncovered in Crete, and it was by accident like everything. A farmer was parking his tractor under a tree for some reason, and it started to sink or something, and there's even a picture of the hole. There it is. Holy macaroni, literally. There's, there's the hole. That's not Al's hole. Shut up, Al! He's a little pissed that there's another hole. But look at this. This is what they found inside. Sarcophagus. Looks like a guy's face. Look at a nose and a weird little mouth that looks like a penis. But that's creepy. But there's also some urns and other stuff that are thousands of years old. A 3,400-year-old Minoan tomb has been uncovered in an unnamed farmer's olive grove. Because if they named him, oh, there'd be people there. It's near... Era Petra on the Greek island of Crete. According to Credit Post, the farmer was attempting to park his car, under, oh, it was his car, not his tractor, underneath the olive tree when the ground beneath him suddenly began to sink. Dink, dink. A pit with a diameter of 1.2 meters and a depth of more than 2.5 meters, enough to fit Al Gore, was excavated in the grove, after which a chamber tomb was discovered, dug into the soft limestone of the area. The access to the tomb was made by a vertical trench while stone masonry sealed the entrance. The interior of the tomb was divided into three carved niches, like little, well, you get it. An intact coffin with a cover in place was found in the most so southern of the niches. You know what they say about niches, they get stitches. The well-preserved skeleton was found inside, 14 ritual amphorae, an amphorae crater with an inherited fact in a bowl, what were they smoking, were found beneath the coffin. In the northern niche was found another container with another adult skeleton and additional vessels near it. Apparently the Anunnaki gold was missing. But definitely a fantastic find. Let's blow it up. Why wouldn't we? Hello! 
You want to know how to see the Lyrid meteor showers this month? Well, you subscribe to the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and listen when we tell you how to do it. The peak is, well, I don't know. Let me see. Lyrid meteor shower. Every year the Lyrids occur between April 14th and the 30th of April. With the peak in 2023 predicted for the night of 22-23 April. That would be the morning of April 23rd. That's amazing. The shower has a modest peak ZHR of 18 meteors per hour, but it does have a number of factors in its favor. There will be little moonlight, and if you live in a region of dark sky like I do, you'll see them all. All you have to do is look through between Keystone and the Summer Triangle, Cygnus is here, Lyra, Hercules, and the radiant will move from the 15th of April to the 20th of April to the 22nd, 23rd of April here at the peak, what a tweak, to the 25th of April, the radiant moves. It's almost like we're moving through the whole, wow, how, do we, how are we doing that? Anyway, when preparing to see one of the annual meteor showers like the Lyrids, it also pays to consider the phases and rising and setting of the moons. And in this case, it's a boom. If the peak activity occurs during a bright full moon, you're screwed. But the moon will be new on the 21st of April, so the peak here is just two days later. Hello! And will not interfere whatsoever. This creates a very favorable situation for the 2023 Lyrids. So if you've never seen a meteor shower, albeit this is weak, it will be the most pristine environment to actually see a shooting star like Al Gore. Actually, he's a, anyway. Now, scientists who study centarians, these are people who lived over 100 years old, say they've found another key to living beyond 100. If you want to know the key to longevity, well, it doesn't matter because in seven years, we'll be immortal, according to scientists, but you'll need a billion dollars. Anyway, if you want to live to 100 the natural way, stop buying food from the supermarket and grow your own. Also, Get a sense of purpose, for goodness sake. The reason you're dying is because you have no, no sense of purpose. Be part of a community. Now, this is going to benefit you because when the grid goes down, you're going to need other people to help survive and thrive in the future. You're going to need a community, a hell of a good one, with hard workers, not millennials. You're going to need spirituality. I don't mean Christianity or a Muslim or any particular religion. Just believe in something bigger than you. I can tell you that there is something bigger than all of us out there. And it's our ego getting in the way. So meditate. Pray. Try something different. Learn how to manage stress, which includes prayer and meditation. Exercise. Do some Shinrin-yoku. Go hike in the woods. But the most important thing that all of them had in combination is that they were all exposed to lots of bugs and viruses. None of these schmucktards wore a mask. Hello! And that's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance as well as information. So stay tuned for more important information. Subscribe to the channel. Become a Patreon. Support the work we do. We love you. Be safe. Mm-hmm.